Thank yeah. you, Madam Mr. Secretary. I had a question about uh, your early slide where you looked at the uh, gains that you've made in emissions reductions, mm -hmm. and you looked at the gains that were made by policy and the gains that were made not by policy, right, mm -hmm. by, um, by other things that were happening in the universe at the mm -hmm. same time. Do you imagine that those gains, the gains not made by policy, that they'll shrink over time? Um, or are you going to factor them in as sort of holding constant at a 9% or so? Because I, I would imagine, you know, we're going to we're going to finish closing coal plants, for example. Right. That was one of the examples right. that you gave. You know, we're, we're going to have some of these large milestone efforts. Yep. Um, and I would imagine that they, my own estimation would be that that uh, gains not made by policy would begin to shrink. I was just curious. Right. Well, I will take a stab at it, but then I'm going to turn it over to um, my team who does the, the modeling and looking <coughs> at that. Our, our reference case that we project out into the future basically looks at business as usual in terms of those background um, things and, and projects those factors out into the future. So for example, we closed our last coal plant in the 70s. Um, and so that is a case where the emission reduction from that would not hold constant over time. It would, that would be you know, the end um, of those emission reductions. But certainly we expect changes So there are some policies um, that were implemented before the GWSA, such as the, some of the energy efficiency programs or the original RPS. So that gets captured in the hash bars. And so while those um, uh, policies, the implementation um, uh, of the original <laughs> RPS will continue forward, the expanded RPS gets counted in the colored bars. And so in the solid bars, you'll see like regs are going to be there as well as um, our uh, procurement of clean energy is going to be counted in the solid bar. So over time, the solid bar should get bigger and bigger. Great. Thank you so much. And then I just had one um, one yep. item around the land use. Yes. You know, so I represent the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District. Yes. And as you know, you were just there. Yeah. Thank you for coming. You know, there is a, a <coughs> great deal of concern uh, about the kind of um, the pull that farmers and landowners who are steward and forests are feeling um, because there isn't yet enough regulation to help understand, say for example, solar panels in relation to open spaces, farmland, forest, uh, the kind of tug on biomass, um, and you know, and the kind of way in which the state needs to invest in our forests and green space to help the landowners who are stewarding it have another alternative other than clear cutting. Um, or whole, you know, large-scale solar arrays, um, and so I, you know, the most questions I got about today's hearing were people really concerned about uh, the state needing to step forward and really help guide um, the better use of solar, say for example on rooftops or over highways or things like that, rather than the kind of wholesale solar that we're we're finding is um, creeping into Western Massachusetts and could threaten a number of things. Clear cutting. Well, there's, there's, there's all kinds of clear cutting and there are farmers giving up their land, right? So if we need the kind of balance <coughs> between agriculture and forestry for uh, for food and for sequestration, uh, I think we need that kind of balance in the kind of modeling going forward. We, we absolutely agree. It's one of the reasons we're looking at the importance of land use to meeting our overall goals. We're also looking at the importance of natural landscapes and nature-based solutions for meeting our mitigation goals as well, um, but I would turn over the solar question. We certainly are hearing some of the same concerns um, from Western Massachusetts communities around solar and data capture. I'd, first of all, echo um, Undersecretary Thea Parity's, we couldn't agree with you more. We're really seeing, we're hearing from the same people about pressure of redeveloping farmland, clear cutting for municipalities, what that does for open space, um, in some ways, it's, it's uh, what we see is a top priority when we do a review of the SMART program. We had identified this, and there is a reduced compensation for open space that is used for redevelopment for solar. But quite frankly, the, the price reductions that we've seen from solar have overwhelmed
around some of the price discounts that we assign to the program. Right. And uh, we are very concerned that we're seeing uh, increased development right. rather than reduced development, which was the intent of the program. Right. It seems like there needs to be greater incentives, right, and greater disincentives to put solar on the places that we know will continue to work but will not lead to you know, wholesale clear right. cutting. And, and not to, to prejudge our review, but uh, I think the Commonwealth increasingly needs to see solar of its locational value, of uh, meeting where it is in load, and not just simply looking at increased production of solar. We'll get more ratepayer benefits of prioritizing location of where solar is installed going forward. Right. And just because you mentioned the SMART program, Mr. Chair, if I just may, um, out in Western Massachusetts, you know this, we, we had a, you know, we are, we are prone to want solar, and yet the SMART program, as you know better than I, you know, didn't have as many spots open for Western Mass folks and developers, right? So I hear from cities and towns all the time and individuals who want to access and bring in solar. We just haven't been able to open it up for them. So I'm excited for you know, a rethink of the way in which Western Mass wants to go forward. And you know, we are four, you know, four very, very large counties in the Commonwealth. We just need that kind of equitable distribution.